When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, Unshaken Saints. I'm Jared Halverson. And after last week's lesson on the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, which was hard, I am grateful that this week we have nothing but good news in session 137 and 138. I want to introduce them by telling a story. When I was home for my mission, for, I've been home for a while, uh, probably a couple of years, and I was back in California visiting my parents. And I'm sitting there in sacrament meeting in the overflow in the very back, and I'm looking at the back of the head of someone in front of me. Uh, wondering if it's at all familiar, because uh, it kind of seemed like it was. Uh, eventually, the, I, I saw the face and was shocked. You see, there was a, a guy on my football team. He was a senior when I was a junior, uh, and then he went off and graduated. We weren't super close, but uh, we're on the same team. We were teammates. Uh, he was affectionately known by his nickname, Scum. Uh, and, and that name can just kind of give you some mental suggestions as far as his personality was concerned. Uh, not a member of the church, uh, not, not as far as I could tell, probably not a member of any church. I had no idea. Uh, but there he was sitting at church uh, years after the fact that, or years after that I'd known him. And I just sat there in disbelief going, what is Scum doing here? Uh, but I, you know, saw him and we recognized each other. I'm like, hey, Scum, how you doing? It's so good to see you. Catch me up on life. And, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm a member of the church. I was like, w what? Uh, Brother Scum, how did that happen? He told me the conversion story, he went on a mission. I'm like, Elder Scum, even better. Uh, he had married in the temple uh, one of the girls that, were, that was my age that was just one of the most amazing, uh, solid, faithful, pure, uh, wonderful uh, young women that, that I knew in the stake. And just, I, I just thought, what in the world? How is this even possible? Uh, things that I never had supposed, I'll put it that way. Uh, it was an amazing experience for me to think, shame on me for assuming that, that scum would never be brother scum or elder scum or married in the temple scum and no more scum at all. Uh, just, just a celestial soul that was waiting to be coaxed out of, of hiding Knowing, wa wanting to find the truth, but not knowing where to find it, even though he was surrounded by Latter-day Saints that I guess just let reputations or assumptions get in the way. The point I'm trying to make with, with his story is that you never know the, the, the happy endings that will follow. Uh, and I've, I've heard it said that you'll be surprised by the people that you see in heaven. And believe me, they'll be surprised to see you too. <laughs> and as I think of that, I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots of people surprised if I make it there. And I imagine that perhaps you've felt that way too. But that kind of good news, that the, the shock and awe, not just of how glorious heaven is, but how generous the Lord is in inviting his children in. Uh, we sometimes, unfortunately, think of the celestial kingdom and picture our, in our heads the beginning of a stake dance uh, where nobody's there on time. Uh, and there's like a high counselor at the punch bowl and an and, and empty gym and uh, not a whole lot of fun being had. That is not the celestial kingdom. And to be able to understand just how merciful, just how generous Heavenly Father is, uh, to, to picture yourself in the celestial kingdom and to picture so many other people that you never would have imagined there as well. There are so many names for Jesus uh, throughout the standard works. And one of my favorites... It's one we hardly ever use because it's just too long to even remember. Uh, it's found in Ephesians chapter 3, where Jesus is called, Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Again, that's a mouthful. But I love the concept. Whatever you think, whatever you ask, Jesus can do more. He can go exceedingly above and beyond it. And that's the message of section 137 and 138 today. 
137, a vision from Joseph Smith of the celestial kingdom, shocked by who he sees there. And in 138, a vision by his nephew, uh, Joseph F. Smith, that is equally mind-blowing to, to understand just how much above what we imagined Jesus Christ is able to do. Heaven will be a heavenly place, believe me. Now, one of the reasons these, we talked earlier that, that 133 is supposed to be the end of the Doctrine and Covenants, and then we get a PS and a PPS and a PPS. Well, these two revelations are PPSs uh, that weren't canonized originally in the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 137 c probably could have and should have been. Uh, incredible revelation that we'll see uh, in a study in a moment. But these two revelations were added to the, doc the Pearl of Great Price uh, in 1976. And they only stayed there for a brief time period because by the time the LDS edition of the scriptures were done in 1981, they were moved from the D Pearl of Great Price to the Doctrine and Covenants as these two final sections. Again, visions from, from Uncle Joseph and from Nephew Joseph F. Smith uh, that are mind-blowing as far as just how wide open heaven is supposed to be. So in 137, Joseph Smith is in the not yet dedicated Kirtland Temple. This is January of 1836. Remember, it's not going to be dedicated for another three months. There will be heavenly messengers that come uh, with Moses and Elias and Elijah. Uh, but here Joseph is there, they've done the washing of feet, uh, performed some other ordinances, and then visions just open up upon him and upon several of the other church leaders that are there assembled. This one is, is mind-blowing for Joseph because of what he, not just what he sees, namely the celestial kingdom, but who he sees there. So in verse 1, the heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God and the glory thereof, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. We talked about this at the beginning of the year when we were studying the first vision, that some people want to uh, discredit Joseph because there were multiple accounts of the first vision. To me, I'm grateful he kept trying to put into words the ineffable. Uh, when something is ineffable, in other words, it's, it's not effable. It's not uh, put into languageable. It's just really hard to describe. And for those of us like me who have never had a visionary experience, it, far be it for me to judge someone else for attempting to put into language things that go so far beyond mortal words. And so when you see both Lehi and Alma the Younger describe their visions of God, and they say things like, me thought I saw. It's like, what, what is this? This is so far beyond and outside of the norm. Is this what I'm, am I really seeing this? Uh, or as you'll study from, from Paul, where Paul is caught up to the third heaven. He describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He, he speaks in the third person, but most scholars believe he's referring to himself. And he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. And then this phrase, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Anyway, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man. Again, he repeats it. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Again, visions are so far out of the realm of everyday experience that I'm happy to cut Joseph or Paul or Lehi or Alma all the slack they want as they're trying to come up with language to capture it. So Joseph Am I in the body? Am I not? Is this a, a physical vi vision? Is this a, a spiritual parting of the veil? I don't even know. But I saw the celestial kingdom and was overwhelmed by the glory of that place. Thankfully, unlike Paul, he is permitted to tell us a few things. And so he describes what he sees. Verse 2, I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which was like unto circling flames of fire. Gates we often picture as being shut. Uh, and so the, the pearly gates, as we typically call them, sometimes have this sense of, of closure and you're on the, on the wrong side of them. And yet, how does Joseph describe these gates? Not as something to, be, to keep people out, but rather the transcendent beauty of them. There's something that draws me in. That's the thing about, about transcendent beauty. You just want to get a better view. And so gates that by their very appearance draw you. There's an incredible uh, hymn called The Holy City that speaks of Jerusalem. I learned it when I was a student studying abroad there and we sang it at this, at this concert and it has 
been one of my favorite messages ever since because it, it describes a city that is closed to so many people. One side of the political or religious divide wants to keep it closed from the other. The Israeli-Palestinian divide or the, the Jewish-Muslim divide. And sure enough, Jerusalem to this day, the old city at least, has this massive wall around it. But that wall is full of gates. Now they're not pearly, but to understand a little bit about what Joseph is seeing here, listen to these words from that beautiful hymn. The third verse describes the holy city as the celestial city and puts it in these terms. And once again the scene was changed, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on its streets. The gates were open wide and all who would might enter and no one was denied. After spending five months in that glorious city, but being saddened by so many closed gates, symbolically speaking. I remember singing that song at that, at that concert and just being moved to tears as I saw a room filled with both Palestinians and Israelis, both Muslims and Jews and Christians, singing of a day when those gates would open wide. In fact, in the first verse of that song, it says in the chorus, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to your king. It's the king that, lets the, that decides to let down the drawbridge. It's the king that decides to open those gates. And, and here, as Joseph sees these, these gates with their transcendent beauty that just draws you in, the king wants to open them, open them wide, lift up the gates and sing that all who would might enter and none would be denied. If you desire to be with God, then we'll find a way to help you in. In fact, when he describes that beauty as circling flames of fire, fire is purifying. And to think of those who are purified by the, by the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. So you can come into this transcendently beautiful place. Transcendent, by the way, is such a beautiful word because it's not necessarily religious or not only, not solely religious. My wife is an addiction recovery counselor and my son on his service mission is, is helping work with those that are in recovery. And, and the idea of needing to tap into a higher power, to come unto God however you perceive God to be. Uh, and so they often begin in kind of non-religious language. And the idea of transcendence is such a beautiful beginning, a step toward a heavenly father that we can come to know personally. For that transcendence, if they've ever felt, if you and I have ever felt a sense of awe when the jaw just drops without us being able to help it, as we're overwhelmed with something that is so far beyond and above us, thus is the beauty of the gates. We're not even in the celestial kingdom yet. Just the gates themselves. Come, pass through them. Be encircled about by that circling flame of purifying fire be drawn in by the transcendent beauty and the transcendent love of God. In verse 3, he saw also the blazing throne of God, whereon was seated the Father and the Son. Again, this sense of fire, of purification. But what an odd throne that both the Father and the Son are seated together upon it. Well, if you think that's strange, there's still room for more. And that's part of the beauty of what the Lord is, is inviting us into. Again, being drawn in by these transcendently beautiful gates, but then also being drawn to this, this blazing throne because your seat's been saved. You're meant to sit there with them. In Revelation chapter 3, the promise is made to those who overcome. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Again, it's hard to imagine what this throne looks like. Transcendently beautiful, I'm sure. But room for everyone, that all who would might enter, come have a seat, not just close to us, but, but with us in our very throne. It's like what Romans describes as becoming heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Not to usurp them, not to pass over them, Definitely not to kick them off their throne, but the fact that they would invite us to share it with them is, is awe-inspiring. Again, incredibly generous. 
Verse 4, I saw the beautiful streets of that kingdom, which had the appearance of being paved with gold. Remember the vision Joseph Smith had in the Kirtland Temple, would have been three and a half months after this vision. We see it in section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where not just uh, Elijah and, and Elias and Moses appear, but that Jesus appears to accept this house that's been dedicated to his name. And remember what was underneath his feet? This, this paved work in the color of amber? In some ways, it's not the streets paved with gold, but it's a little standing place for the Savior. You see, the thing about gold is it's incorruptible. It doesn't rust. And imagine, I mean, no wonder it's the washing of the feet that becomes such a powerful ordinance. Uh, a moment in the Last Supper or what Joseph Smith had done that very uh, day that he has this vision in 137. Because your feet can't help but pick up the dirt of the world as you wander through it. Unless, of course, those streets are paved with gold. And so to think about being incorruptible, the, the purity, gold in four, or blazing fire in three and two, the purity of this place, and the fact that we are invited to enter, definitely there was some, some washing of feet that prepared us for this kind of experience. Now, after seeing this transcendent beauty of the place in one, two, three, four, he then starts to notice the people. Now, the first few shouldn't surprise us. I mean, who else would you expect to see in the celestial kingdom than the list beginning in verse 4? I saw Father Adam and Abraham. Well, of course they're going to make it. But then he also sees my father and my mother, which is odd because they haven't yet passed away. And then, f truly shocking, he also saw his brother Alvin that has long since slept. Now, take those kind of three groups in order. In some ways, they're actually all surprising. Uh, now you'd think, wait, Adam and Abraham, it's surprised to see them in the Celestial Kingdom? Are you kidding me? If they don't get in, there's, not, there's no hope for me. But actually, through a lot of Christian history, they've wrestled with that because Adam and Abraham both lived before Jesus Christ. And from a, a purely biblical perspective, uh, did they know? Did they know of him? I mean, we can assume that or we can read and understand prophecy and symbolism and so on. But if you're being super strict when it comes to the Bible, then the, the question remains, can people that lived before Jesus and therefore didn't know of him as clearly as post-New Testament saints would, can they be saved? It's almost the question of can you be saved by Jesus without knowing Jesus? And, and that's, that's, that's a tricky one. Remember John 14, 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me. There is no salvation independent of Jesus. We see that in the Book of Mormon. We see it in the Doctrine and Covenants. We see it throughout the New Testament, that no, there is no other name given under heaven whereby man can be saved. And if you stick to uh, a strictly interpreted Old Testament, when the name Jesus never appears, then did the people know? Now, through Christian history, they thought, well, there, there's got to be a way. Again, the thought of, <laughs> of closing the gates to an Abraham or an Adam, are you kidding me? I mean, you do get Jesus saying in the New Testament, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. So there's got to be something there. There's got to be some hope for those that lived before him. Uh, but again, was, was, was there baptism? We would say yes, uh, but they would say no. And so there's this challenge of then how do they get in? And most will kind of oh, turn a blind eye, so to speak, and go, well, God must have some kind of way. Well, that's the first one. The second group is mother and father. Now, uh, Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack Smith were incredibly good people, but they were still alive. And so in some ways, Joseph's like, wait, what? Did, did I miss something? Or is this a ah, preview of coming attractions? We saw a few weeks ago in section 132 that the idea of having your calling and election made sure. We saw the Lord reaffirm to Joseph Smith that, that you're going to make it. Well, here he has a similar experience about his own parents. Mom and Dad, good news. I saw you in the celestial kingdom. You're going to make it. It's like when Abinadi says, and if Christ had not come, and then he realized, oh, he hasn't come yet. I'm still a BC saint. <laughs> Sorry. Um, prophetic gifts make it hard sometimes with, with verb tense. And so it's hard to erase on gold plate. So he just says, speaking of things to come as though they already had come. 
And that's exactly what's happening here. I'll speak of things to come, my parents' exaltation, as though it already had come because I saw it. Now, again, surprising because of past tense Old Testament prophets, surprised because of this future tense, they're not even dead yet, but they're going to make it. And then ultimate surprise when he sees in vision his brother Alvin. See, Alvin had died in 1823. Joseph had had his experience with the angel Moroni, uh, and few people were as excited about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon as Joseph's brother Alvin. Uh, this was the oldest son. This was the birthright boy. This was everybody's favorite older brother. Just as good a as they come. And yet he'd never been baptized in a church. Remember, dad is more of a, a sp I'm spiritual but not religious. Okay, And the family split along different denominational lines and so on. And he was just as Christ-like and good as they come, but had never officially taken upon himself the name of Christ through baptism. And when he dies, through medical malpractice basically, uh, a minister who comes to speak at his, uh, give the funeral sermon, makes it very clear that he believes that Alvin is in hell and there's no hope for him. Well, he's strictly interpreting the Bible and if you're not born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter in the kingdom of God. So, sorry Alvin, that's as far as it goes. And Joseph would have spent the last decade plus dealing with that. Now, section 76 would have given him a little hope. In verse 72, behold, these are they who died without law. So they didn't know fully, and that would describe Alvin pretty well. Keep going. Also, they who are the spirits of men kept in prison, whom the Son visited and preached the gospel unto them, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. We're going to see that reality expanded exponentially in section 138. And then verse 74, who received not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. Well, does that include somebody like Alvin? Now, as we see here, Alvin has, is far beyond the terrestrial kingdom. This is a vision of the celestial, and he's there. Joseph's left scratching his head. Which makes us understand that what he's describing there in section 76 about terrestrial glory are those that did have the chance in this life, but didn't accept it, but then had a coming to themselves experience in the next. And in Alvin's case, some kind of post-mortal change of heart was not necessary. His heart was totally in the right place on this side of the veil. And so what's the outcome for him as far as judgment is concerned? Here Joseph is blown away. It's celestial glory. I mean, listening to this Protestant sermon at the funeral, there is no hope. It's, it's flat out hell. Getting in section 76, years later, there's this moonlit hope. Okay, maybe terrestrial glory? And here, 1836, by the way, no better place to get this ultimate hope than in the temple. And that's where Joseph is. Not even dedicated yet, but there in a place dedicated, soon to be dedicated to the name and work of God. To be given hope for those that you had lost hope about. That the future is more glorious than we can imagine. And God is more generous than I could, I could have assumed. I'll be surprised at the people I see in heaven, and they'll be surprised to see me too. You see, that's what Joseph says in verse 6. I marveled how it was that he had obtained an inheritance in that kingdom. Not for any fault or, or unworthiness on his part. He was amazing. But seeing that he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. How is this possible? By the way, we, we miss something, the fact that this is section 137. And so we read it after we've already read 127 and 128 about baptisms for the dead. But remember, that's 1840, so this is still 1836. And so Joseph doesn't know anything about baptisms for the dead yet. Uh, again, line, this is such a great example of line upon line, precept upon precept, even insofar as his own big brother is concerned. And the, the, the growth of hope that comes with an increase of understanding. That you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, Jesus said. Well, they, these truths are setting Joseph free from despair or from doubt or just this sense of loss and hopelessness for someone that he loved so much. Uh, the same is true for each of us as well as each of those that don't know the truth because we haven't shared it with them yet. To, to understand this, there is glorious hope for those that have not even been baptized in this life. I saw them in this electric kingdom. I don't, I don't know how it works, but, but it's possible. 
Verse 7, he then says, Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, So here's the doctrine. I saw something. Well, now I, I want to make sense of this. And so the, the Lord explains, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it, if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. And with line upon line ongoing revelation, the portion that God gives us today always supersedes the portion that God gave us yesterday. We are growing up in him and coming to a fuller understanding. And so if you thought, based on section 76, that, that well, if you, if you thought based on a strict interpretation of the Bible that hell was all you got, uh-uh. If you thought that terrestrial kingdom was the best that could be uh, for those that, that died without the chance, then that's not, that's not a full understanding either. Celestial glory is theirs. And there's a, not just a mercy there, there's a justice there. I never had the chance. In, in Christian history, there's a, a question called the fate of the unevangelized. And that's the question of what happens to those, if, if you can only be saved through Jesus Christ, then what happens to those that never had the chance? And those that are strict on the justice of the Bible, saying it has to be through Jesus, then unfortunately have to look pretty heartless by saying, well, they go to hell. Or they have to look uh, almost overly flexible when it comes to Scripture to think, well, there must be some other way. At least the, the, the Old Testament prophets had to get in somehow. But the beauty of, of visions like 137, and then couple the vision with a, a doctrine that we see here, as far as, no, celestial glory, then wait a few more years and couple it with a practice, namely baptisms for the dead, in the right place, needs to be in the temple. Ah, you see how it's all coming together now? I, I had a hope. Here I actually have a vision. See, it, ever, it starts with hope for everybody. Just like we talked about with, with eternal marriage, that most people out there that have a loving marriage and family relationships just assume, they just hope, that of course we're going to be together forever. But the hope here becomes vision. The vision becomes doctrine. The doctrine becomes practice. And we can actually do these things. We can actually help them happen. And it's, it's amazing, again, to watch this unfolding of revelation so that we come to not just an understanding, but a, a participation in these kinds of things. Now, verse 8, we get another expansion. So if verse 7 seems to suggest people like Alvin that have passed on, that died before the restoration. I mean, that's how he describes it in 6, right? It was before the Lord set his hand the second time to gather Israel. So pre-restoration people that were valiant, that, were, that would have accepted celestial kingdoms theirs. Well, what about those from here on out? Because now the gospel has been restored in its fullness. So is it up to, to us to make sure the water gets to the end of the road before anyone passes away? That's a tall order. Uh, verse 8 softens that then. Also all that shall die henceforth, so from this moment on, without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. You understand that the, I'll take the will for the deed? We saw that back in section 124 about building the temple in Zion. I know you wanted to, and if you hadn't been blocked, if there hadn't been obstacles, you would have done it. I'm going to give you other opportunities to prove your, your diligence and your faithfulness. And for that one, I'll accept the, the will for the deed. I love that the Lord is willing to do that with those who have died or will die without the chance to accept the gospel in its fullness. Death is not, judgment isn't passed at death. As we learn later, there is still spirit world. And there are, is still growth and progress and repentance and vicarious ordinances. It, it's not final until final judgment, and death is not that day. So hold out hope. Verse 9, For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. So it's not just what you did. It's what you wanted to do. It's, it's what you desired. And if your heart's in the right place, then it doesn't matter that you lived in the wrong century or were born in a country that was closed off from the fullness of the gospel. All of those, all the unfairnesses and injustices of life are made right by the atonement of Jesus Christ. And, and his judgment is right as well. Nothing unfair about it. 
And if you thought verse 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 opened the, those pearly gates wider than imagined, then <laughs> look at verse 10. It almost seems like an afterthought, but this is a glorious truth. I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. When Joseph translated the Book of Mormon close to a decade ago by this time, he would have learned from Moroni 8, for example, that little children are alive in Christ, that there was no need to baptize them, that they are, they are saved through the atonement of Jesus Christ, independent of, of any action on their part, because they're unaccountable. So here in verse 10, this clarifies it. The years of accountability, notice it didn't just say if they die before age 8. The scriptures are typically more, more vague when it speaks of the age or the years of accountability, because accountability really is an individualized thing. So whether it's, it's age or mental capacity, uh, whenever you get to a point where you are accountable, then yes, it starts to count. And you need to be baptized for the remission of sins because you have some. But for those that die before they arrive at that age, whatever that age is for individual them, they will be saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. Can you think of Joseph and Emma burying almost half of the children that they gave birth to? The devastation of infant mortality throughout most of human history, it's only re relatively recently that that giving birth has not been, and it still, it, it still is a passing through the valley of the shadow of death for both mother and child. But surrounded by experts and technology and everything else, the, the specter of infant mortality is not what, it, what it's always been. Well, verse 10 of section 137 holds out so much hope for bereaved mothers and devastated fathers who wonder about those children that they buried when they intended or imagined being buried by those children someday instead. Children are supposed to bury parents. Parents aren't supposed to bury children. But verse 10, from, from that perspective, as devastating as a loss is through mortality, it is not a loss through eternity. In fact, it's a promise of celestial glory. Deaths that seem premature from our perspective are only tragedies on this side of the veil. As Joseph Smith himself once said to those that were mourning their losses, all your losses will be made up to you in the resurrection, provided you continue faithful. By the vision of the Almighty, I have seen it. And it was visions like section 137 that proved it to, to him. There is so much hope breathing out of every verse of section 137. For those who died before accountability, for those who died before the restoration, for those who die that the restoration has not yet reached, for those who, it's incredible to see just how open the pearly gates are. No wonder they're so transcendently beautiful. All of this reminds me of two of my favorite phrases from Joseph Smith. One phrase is, paternal regard, and the other is ample provision. Coming from two quotes from Joseph Smith. The first one, while one portion of the human race is judging and condemning the other without mercy, the great parent of the universe looks upon the whole of the human family with a fatherly care and paternal regard. Ready to condemn people that never had a chance to come unto him? That doesn't sound fatherly. So it's paternal regard. He looks at us better than we look at each other. And then the other phrase, he knows the situation of both the living and the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption. He's provided for it. He's provided a way. He is the way. Out of that paternal regard, he has made ample provision. He's provided a way for all of his children to come home. And it's not just our hope. It's our vision. And more than our vision, it's our doctrine. It's our practice. We have theology to teach this. We have ordinances to make sure that it happens. It, what a blessing that God's ample provision can give us all hope. And if section 137 wasn't enough to prove that to us, then wait another few generations. And in 1918, Joseph Smith's nephew, 
Hiram's boy, Joseph F. Smith, receives another vision. Again, by the visions of the Almighty, I have seen it. Well, now Joseph F. Smith is seeing something that blows his mind and everyone else's who reads it. In some ways, it's so fitting for section 138 to follow on the heels of 137 in our scripture study because it's line upon line and vision upon vision as we come to a fuller understanding of, of this doctrine of just how ample the provision of our, of our Father in heaven is. Now for 138, the context is fascinating. As you see in the chapter heading, the recipient of this vision is Joseph F. Smith and the date is October of 1918. Now both of those details are important. This is the end of Joseph F. Smith's life. He will pass away a month and a half later. And death has been something that has, that has followed him throughout his entire lifetime. His father Hiram and uncle Joseph were killed in Carthage. His angel mother, Mary Fielding Smith, had died when he was still a teenager. If you've ever seen in obituaries where it says preceded in death by, which is the sad realization that people that were expected to outlive them did not. Well, for Joseph F. Smith, he was preceded in death by a wife, 13 children. I mean, his son Hiram, who was an apostle named after his own father, died that year at age 45. One of his daughters-in-law had passed away just a few months later. Not only personally for Joseph F. Smith, but as far as worldwide, death was on everyone's mind in October of 1918. World War I had just ended the year before, with more than 9 million military deaths, as well as millions of civilian deaths as well. And if you thought the, the global pandemic of COVID-19 was bad, well, rewind the clock a century and imagine the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 where according to most estimates, 50 million people died worldwide. In fact, October of 1918 was, was the greatest number of deaths in American history. So yes, death is on everyone's mind. Joseph F. Smith here will have a vision of the redemption of the dead. Like we saw in section 137, death is not the end. Uh, in 138, it makes much more clear anything that we saw before as far as the logistics of that is concerned. Again, we saw some of those verses in section 76 where Joseph is understanding that the gospel is preached to the dead. You can read that in the New Testament and, and Joseph S. Smith does. We'll see that in just a moment. But to understand more clearly how it works, how the gospel is preached, and again, couple it with work for the dead, that we understand baptisms baptism for the dead. We understand temple work. In fact, I remember my very last area in the mission field, we were teaching this family that was so devoutly Catholic. Uh, the husband just refused to budge, but the wife was so open to, to truth from wherever that when she started reading the Book of Mormon, she was so excited about it. She, she told us at one point when her husband was running across the street to get, to, to get the, his mother, the secretary at the Catholic parish uh, and a teacher of catechisms and, and go bring the Catholic encyclopedia so we can push back against the apostasy. Uh, amazing family. But the wife was like, once the husband was out of earshot, so I know it's true. I want to join the church. I just don't want to break up my family over this. We're like, we get it. Uh, well, you've you got to get your husband to read the Book of Mormon. That's the only hope. But I still remember this one conversation where we taught the fourth discussion, which back in the day dealt with these kinds of principles. Uh, the idea of work for the dead and an eternal family and temple work and all that kind of stuff. My favorite discussion. Uh, what was amazing though, as we taught them this, <laughs> a couple of things. When we first explained because the fate of the unevangelized is a question that most people have, a lot of them do, uh, of just, wait a minute, if, if you take baptism seriously, I should say, and Catholics really, really do, right? That's why they perform infant baptisms. For them, baptism is so essential that we have to baptize infants because there is no salvation outside of it. Now, again, we, we don't agree. Uh, section 137, verse 10 clarifies that. What happens with a child, a baby that isn't baptized, it's fine. But for those of us with the, the years of accountability behind us, it is required. Well, then are we sending every non-baptized uh, post-child to hell? And that doesn't seem just or merciful. Well, sensitive souls have wrestled with that for centuries, as I've already said. But when we taught this family about work for the dead, 
Like the wife was like almost bouncing out of her chair. Like, are you serious? This, it's like, this is the answer. I've always wondered what happens to those that never had a chance to hear about Jesus Christ. And this, I, I love what she said. She just looks at us in disbelief and said in Spanish, me han sacado del aire, which means you've taken me out of the air. It's like I was floating there with no, no feet fixed on gospel ground. I didn't have an answer. And so I was as, as, as aimless as, as I pictured them to be floating around in limbo. Well, now I'm no longer floating around in some kind of intellectual or spiritual limbo. That is the answer. In fact, still holding strong to their Catholicism, the husband and wife were like, this is true. This is, this is the way you do it. Why didn't God tell this to the Pope so everyone would know? And I just kind of smiled and said, well, do you remember the verse Jesus said about putting new wine in old bottles? That should actually tell you something about the lesson we had last time about the apostasy that was so hard to hear. The fact that God did reveal it to Joseph Smith instead of to the Pope so everyone would know. I don't want to say anything against Catholicism, and I love Pope Francis. He's, when I see the picture of him and President Nelson together, I'm like, ah, oh, there's my Pope and my prophet all together hanging out. Uh, I love the good that is being done there. But as far as the doctrine is concerned, it was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. And this doctrine, this truth, this practice does sacarnos del aire. It does take us out of the air. It sets our feet down and we can move forward and extend the blessings of exaltation, celestial glory to those who never had the chance to hear it in this life. Take what we learned in section 76 and couple it with what we learned in section 127 and 128, and add 137, and now capstone, 138. How does this all happen on that side of the veil? For a long time, we've been practicing the work for the dead on this side of the veil. Well, if there were ever a practice and doctrine, if there were ever a belief that, that tears the veil apart to connect this side with that side, it is the redemption of the dead. And this vision clarifies it magnificently. So let's set the scene. Verse 1, on the 3rd of October, in the year 1918, I sat in my room pondering over the scriptures. Now, I said set the scene, and I want you to do that literally. Imagine if you were a, a movie director, and you were trying to film a reenactment of section 138. So far, what do you have? Okay, uh, You're going to have to have some some period costumes, some period artwork. You're going to try to set the scene so that people can tell that it's 1918. Maybe there's a newspaper on the desk with the date or some statistics of, from the Spanish flu epidemic. And then you see this, this aged man, long flowing white beard, sitting in his room, so some kind of maybe big uh, puffy upholstered chair, and he's pondering over the scriptures. Now, what does that look like? Does he have the book open in front of him? Head down as he's stroking his chin? I'll let you be the judge of that. You can, you're the director. You can decide. But picture him pondering. And so far, that's the only action you see. Now, verse 2, and reflecting. Oh, there's another action verb without any action. In verse 1, he's pondering. In verse 2, he's reflecting. And what's he reflecting on? The great atoning sacrifice that was made by the Son of God for the redemption of the world. Honestly, no better thing to reflect upon. And so this sweet old prophet, nearing the end of his life, is thinking about what? The atonement of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, he's reflecting upon the great and wonderful love made manifest by the Father and the Son in the coming of the Redeemer into the world. I mean, Christmas is only two and a half months away. Joseph F. Smith wouldn't live to see or celebrate that Christmas. But here he is thinking of the coming of the Redeemer into the world and the, the great love that is manifest in that act, the love of the Father and the Son. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Jesus so loved the world that he gave his own life that he might draw all men and women unto him. 
Oh, great and wonderful love indeed. Verse 4, that through his atonement and by obedience to the principles of the gospel, mankind might be saved. Sound a little like the third article of faith? We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The order there is key, both in verse 4 here as well as in that third article of faith. It's through the atonement of Christ first and foremost. Oh yes, also obedience to the principles of the gospel and the ordinances of the gospel is required as well. But because of revelations like this one, we see how those two come together. That the atonement, there's the doctrine of what Jesus did, can be coupled with the practice of temple work, which is what we can do. You see, because of this, we don't have to negotiate away either one. We don't have to negotiate away the need for ordinances because God has provided a way whereby every child of God can receive the saving ordinances they need. And we don't have to negotiate away the love of God. That great and wonderful love is made manifest in all of this. His part, atonement, our part, ordinances, it all comes together in the work for the dead. Now, verse 5, are you still, you still filming, directors? While I was thus engaged. Now, I love that verb. Because again, if you're, if you're filming this scene, engaged, nothing's happened yet. I don't know how long you're going to let the camera roll. As it just points to Joseph F. Smith as sitting in this chair pondering, reflecting, but in this word, engaging in some serious spiritual thought. I don't know if we do that enough. Remember that great verse in Exodus when it talks about Moses seeing the burning bush? We've talked about that in here before. That he turns aside to see, and when he turned aside to see, that's when the Lord speaks to him out of the bush. There's something about that, to, to have your mind engaged in pondering and reflecting on spiritual things. I think too often, it's, it, we don't think that we're doing anything if pages aren't turning. When really it's hearts that should be turning all through the process. Our eyes have to keep on moving. When really what God wants is to open the eyes of our understanding. I think we need to do a lot less reading and a lot more thinking in our scripture study. There's a beautiful phrase in 1 Samuel where Samuel turns to Saul and says to him, Stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Can you picture the Lord whispering that to us? Or the Spirit just trying to say, stop, 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 please. You see that burning bush? It's just to catch your attention. Please turn aside to see. It's one of the things that, that makes these videos last so long, so long. Sorry, not sorry. Because you'll be reading and all of a sudden a phrase pops out and you just want to turn aside to see. You get the Spirit prompting you, stand still a while so I can show you the Word of God. In the fifth Psalm it says, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Don't you love that? Like, will you see, Father, that I'm trying, I'm slowing down? I'm trying to be still to know that thou art God. I, I, I'm trying to sit still a while so that you can show me thy word. Please consider my meditation. Don't forget that the holiest place in the church is the most contemplative place, the place of greatest meditation. Because in the celestial room of the temple, we don't do, quote unquote, anything. Oh, well, we do a lot if we do it right. Uh, it, thus engaged. Wow, well, you, were, you were so engaged in the celestial room. Yeah, I was. With my, my mind reflecting upon celestial things. My, my spirit pondering the truths that God has made known to me. I, we can do so much more of that. In, in verse 5, go, keep going. While I was thus engaged, my mind reverted to the writings of the Apostle Peter. To the primitive saints scattered abroad throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and other parts of Asia, where the gospel had been preached after the crucifixion of the Lord. I have to chuckle at that one. Can I just picture? I don't know if my mind has ever reverted to Cappadocia. <laughs> where, where is that place? Uh, but, but what I love about Joseph S. Smith is he knows the scriptures well enough that by thinking about certain things, doctrinal things, he's thinking about the atonement, he's reflecting upon the love of God, and his mind just 
naturally reverts to Scripture. It's like, hmm, this reminds me of something Peter taught as he's writing to the saints throughout the Mediterranean world. That's my dream, to know the Scriptures well enough that my mind can revert to relevant passages, whatever topic I happen to be reflecting upon. That, that's, that's a lofty goal for all of us. Uh, and whether it includes Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, hopefully it, we at least think, oh yeah, isn't there some story in the Book of Mormon that it's ringing a bell? Or, oh, this reminds me of some passage in the New Testament. Where is that? And thankfully, even if our minds can't revert right back to chapter and verse, we can search for it online. Uh, and I would encourage all of us to do just that. Slow down your scripture study. Uh, honestly, the Come, Follow Me curriculum is such a blessing and such a curse. It's a two-edged sword. Uh, it's a blessing because it gets us in the scriptures every week. And I'm hearing from so many of you that you've never been in the scriptures quite like this before. And I'm, I'm so impressed with your willingness and diligence to just dive in. But the curse is that we're on a schedule. The curse is that we've got more to study next week. And what if I just want to stop and savor, ponder, reflect? What if I want to be engaged with a single verse for days on end? What if I want to sit still a while so God can show me his word? What if I want to slow down so I can give God a chance to consider my meditation? I want to learn vertically, and that takes time. So pause your horizontal study of Scripture and allow your mind to revert to other places so that your cloud of witnesses can gather around you and start singing Scripture in your ears. The harmony will be beautiful, believe me. And then verse 6, I opened the Bible. Wait, 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 what? Okay, I needed to know that in my, in my kind of director's notes beforehand. The script needed to let me know that the Scriptures weren't even open yet. So all that we've read to this point, one, two, three, four, five, is with scriptures closed, maybe a book on the desk or a table somewhere. And so all of this is just Joseph F. Smith sitting in a chair in his little 1918 scene, thinking, pondering, reflecting, engaging mentally with the Word of God. And when his mind reverted to scripture, it's like, ah, what, what, where's that verse about Cappadocia again? <laughs> and so he opens the Bible and reads the third and fourth chapters of the first epistle of Peter. And as I read, I was greatly impressed, more than I had ever been before, with the following passages. And then he reads them. And we'll read them too. But before we do, do you remember that passage in, at the end of Joseph Smith history? When Joseph and Oliver had been baptized, they're in the middle of their translation of the Book of Mormon. Learn about baptism, then go and really learn about baptism. Talk about turning aside to see, right? Uh, and the heavens opening. But what is interesting is when they returned to their scriptures afterwards, it was a completely new book to them. I mean, when the, when the heavens open and light shines down upon the Word, you see things in the shadows. <laughs> well, there's no more shadows. Of course you see things. This is how Joseph Smith put it. Our minds being now enlightened, we began to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings and the true meaning and intention of their more mysterious passages revealed unto us in a manner which we never could attain to previously, nor ever before had thought of. Their understanding, remember meaning and intention, there's exegesis and hermeneutic for you biblical scholars out there. Uh, what did it mean? at the time. What did the prophet intend for me to get from it? I mean, he's going to go far beyond just the meaning of First Peter. There's going to be an intentionality here of what was written that Joseph F. Smith is going to understand as, his, as the eyes of his understanding open on these words for the very first time. That's real scripture study, by the way. When mind is blown and you see things that you never thought possible before. Here's a perfect example of how it's done. Well, what does he read? Verse 7, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So there's Christ's atonement, his crucifixion, his resurrection, 
what follows. Verse 8, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So his death enabled him. So by which he went, it enabled him to go and preach to the spirits in prison. Verse 9 explains more about them. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So there's 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, which is a fascinating passage. It's the one that, that we taught to that Catholic family in the fourth uh, discussion. But to see that, whoa, that's what he's talking about there? Christ preached the gospel to the spirits in prison. And then he uses this example, this analogy of Noah and the ark. In fact, that blows me away for, for two reasons. One is what he says at the end. Uh, only few, eight people, were saved by water. So he's using this as an analogy that the, ark of the, uh, the Noah's ark equals the baptismal font in this case. As the earth itself is being immersed in water, the baptism of, of this planet, only eight souls were saved. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. That that's an incredibly tiny minority of people. Well, welcome to the realities as far as baptism is concerned. The number of people that will be saved by water in this life, those that will be baptized for themselves, is, is a tiny minority of the children of God that have lived upon this earth. Eight out of however many. Okay. And so that's one important thing to understand, that baptisms for the dead is the greater work than baptisms for the living. That what, that, what it, that Joseph F. Smith is going to explain here, or learn here in vision, d describes the way that God saves the majority of his children. I mean, as important as the, the threefold mission of the church, of perfecting the saints, that's important, but there's not, that's only like 17 minute, million people affected. Proclaim the gospel, super important. But that only affects potentially like 8 billion people right now. But redeeming the dead, oh, there's billions upon billions upon billions. Every child of God that has ever lived that doesn't come into the, one of the first two categories comes into the third. In some ways, we get to be Noah ourselves. But this time, we get to invite everyone onto the ark. The other side of this is equally merciful when he, he's referring to those who, who have died, those who are at one point were, oh, were disobedient. Now, there's a lot of people you could choose from for that. <laughs> Basically, anyone who's ever lived and died, right? We've all been disobedient. But what I love about this is that if, you're, if, you're, if you need a poster child, so to speak, for the redemption of the dead, who does he pick? He picks the victims of the flood as his poster children for second chances. We sometimes think of the flood as evidence of such a vengeful God that he's just going to wipe the, the slate clean and start over. Well, in some ways he's starting them over with a better opportunity. I sometimes picture what pre-mortality must have looked like during the days of Noah as whoever's turn on earth was coming up looks down and says, I don't like my odds. Uh, I think it was Elder Maxwell that said that, it, that civilization had gotten to the point of destroying agency. That if you come into one of those families, there's no chance for you to grow up with, a, with, with an opportunity to accept the gospel. Uh, years of accountability, well, they're never going to reach it. But you picture all of us looking down going, uh, no thanks, no, you go ahead, you go ahead, I, no, after you, after you. Uh, I don't want to come to earth right now. There's the great scene in the Christmas story when little Ralphie just is white knuckling the top of the water slide, right? And the Santa has to push him down. And I picture that for us. Like, no, I'm not, you know, white knuckle the water slide. I'm not going to go to earth until somebody says, yeah, unless I get to go to Noah's family. That, that's it. I'll only go to earth if you send me to Noah's family. And once, once the logic of that starts to click it spreads like wildfire throughout pre-mortality as everyone starts voicing the same request. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like, me too, me too. None of us are, it's a, it's a big sit down, sit down strike in pre-mortality. None of us are going to earth unless it's in the, the posterity of Noah. And the Lord's like, well, I can actually make that happen. Uh, and then we have the flood and every subsequent generation comes through the posterity of Noah. Okay. But that wasn't harsh. This was bringing them home to try again in the spirit world. 
the gospel will be preached to all the dead, but of all the, the personifications of God's mercy in that doctrine, let's preach the gospel to the flood victims. That's amazing to me. Verse 10 then quotes another scripture that Joseph S. Smith read. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6. Another scripture we always quoted in the, in the fourth discussion. It's too late for them to do certain things in the flesh. They are now living according to God in the spirit. But they can be given opportunity to be judged as if they were still in the flesh. Again, that's why death is not the deadline as far as judgment day is concerned. That we continue on and continue to learn and have the potential to progress even in the spirit world. That's one of the great messages of section 138. Now, verse 11, as I pondered over these things which are written. So many times he's mentioned that, pondering in 11, to go with pondering in 1 and reflecting in 2 and, and mind reverting in 5. All of this is mental engagement. But as he's pondering these things, the eyes of my understanding were opened and the Spirit of the Lord rested upon me and I saw the hosts of the dead, both small and great. This is so similar to the experience his uncle had with section 76. There he and Sidney Rigdon are poring over scripture, John chapter five. And they're pondering and they're thinking and they're reflecting, how does this work? If it's just a heaven and hell, there have to be more kingdoms, kingdoms than one. Many mansions in the father's house, mind going to other scripture, thinking about things, and then all of a sudden, whoa, the veil parts. The eyes of their understanding are open and they see. If you really want to see God's truths, study more like Joseph F. Smith or like Joseph Smith. Now, what do they learn? Verse 12 begins the explanation. All, all that we've seen so far, 1 through 11, is just lead in, build up, okay? And what a message, what a vision will unfold. Verse 12, here we see it. There were gathered together in one place an innumerable company of the spirits of the just, those who had been faithful in the testimony of Jesus while they lived in mortality. Now, we understand our doctrine is death goes to then spirit world. But the spirit world, as we draw our circles, <laughs> there's a dotted line through the middle of it, right? And there's paradise and there's prison, those two halves of the spirit world. Now, it's always been kind of a, a question on people's minds. Well, is it supposed to be a dotted line or, or a, a thick one? How, how are we drawing things? on? What, what's the flannel board story look like today? Well, you can read things like the parable of Lazarus and the, and the dives, where it's this gulf fixed between the two. And so, sorry, rich man, Lazarus can't come and, and quench your thirst uh, with, with a drop of water from his finger. Uh, if verses like that suggest, wow, okay, it's not a dotted line, it's a fixed one. Uh, that there's, no, there's an abyss, some kind of chasm, literal geographic separation between the two sides. Then again, we'll see in section 138, uh, is, it, is it more of a dotted line? And is the, the, differ, the difference or the distance between paradise and prison, is it more figurative than literal? Is it more mental than anything else? That some people know of their freedom, hence paradise, and others do not, hence prison. Section 138 suggests that, that second model, because here's the irony. In verse 12, which side of sp the spirit world are you looking at? If it's the spirits of the just, if they're faithful in their testimony of Jesus, then definitely this is spirit paradise, right? But then keep reading, verse 13. Those who had offered sacrifice in the similitude of the great sacrifice of the Son of God and had suffered tribulation in their Redeemer's name. So again, we're definitely looking at paradise here. These are the good guys. Uh, they, the Old Testament saints, this is Adam and Abraham that we saw in section 137. They were offering sacrifice in similitude of that of Jesus Christ. Nobody did it better than Abraham right? Uh, they died, we, we see this in Hebrews 11, they died firm in the faith. They, they saw this distant city and they lived for it. They embraced it, even, even in expectation. That's what you get in verse 14. All these had departed the mortal life firm in the hope of a glorious resurrection through the grace of God the Father and the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. So there's their hope and their faith and their charity. They lived 
according to the truths that they've been given. And they're in spirit paradise. What are they doing? Verse 15, I beheld that they were filled with joy and gladness and were rejoicing together because the day of what? Their deliverance was at hand. Wait, deliverance? That, if I'm delivered from something, then I must be in some place that I can't escape from myself. Sound a little prison-like? Hmm, but wait a minute. I thought these were the, the spirits in paradise. Well, yeah, they are. Then what do they need deliverance from? Oh, from their prison. Well, no, no, no. But, but they're not in spirit prison. Well, in some ways, as you read section 138, realize that all of the spirit world is spirit prison. Paradise is simply for those mentally who know that they're getting out. I mean, the language that's used throughout is bondage language. It's captivity language. It's prison language. But he's talking about the spirits in paradise. It's just they know the truth. And that knowledge of truth has set them free even before Christ actually comes to liberate them. Notice how this happens. Now, turn the page, verse 16. They were assembled awaiting the advent of the Son of God into the spirit world to declare their redemption from the bands of death. So deliverance, redemption, bands. We're, we're pic picturing chains here, and this is among the righteous. It's just they don't chafe so much upon the ankle or the wrist when you know they're eventually coming off. That's the difference between those in, in the prison side of prison as opposed to the paradise side of prison, that they think it's permanent. They don't know the truth, and so nothing can set them free until they learn that truth. And that's what this is all about. Verse 17, their sleeping dust was to be restored unto its perfect frame, bone to his bone, and the sinews and the flesh upon them, the spirit and the body to be united, never again to be divided, that they might receive a fullness of joy. You remember what Joseph Smith learned back in section 93? That man is spirit, but not only spirit, he's also element. And the elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. No wonder spirits that are separated from their bodies, the physical death, look upon that ex existence as a bondage, that fullness of joy only comes through resurrection. A, a reuniting eternally of perfected element with eternal spirit. It's like what Paul taught. I don't want to be unclothed. I'd rather be clothed upon. Uh, forget Greek philosophy and its, its uh, absence of the body. We want the body. We just want it in its glorified, perfected state. That's the resurrection that Jesus is promising all of us. And that resurrection is escape from the bands of death. Verse 18 while this vast multitude waited and conversed, rejoicing in the hour of their deliverance from the chains of death, the Son of God appeared, declaring liberty to the captives who had been faithful. Again, think of all that language. We saw bands of death. Now we get chains of death. We get liberty, but captives, deliverance among the faithful? Yes, this is spirit paradise. But they are still trapped literally, though they are not trapped mentally, emotionally, spiritually. They know the truth, and the truth has set them free. Well, now the capital truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is literally coming to set them free. No wonder there, this vast multitude is waiting and conversing, talking about this. Reminds me of 3 Nephi 11. Uh, all these people gathered at the temple in Bountiful and they're talking about things and then the voice comes and then descends the Son of God. What else are we going to be waiting for? What else are we going to be talking about? The assembled multitudes of the anxiously awaiting dead. Verse 19, there he preached to them the everlasting gospel, the doctrine of the resurrection and the redemption of mankind from the fall and from individual sins on conditions of repentance. Now, wait a minute. I thought these were the people that had spent their whole lives offering sacrifice in similitude of that exact redemption. I thought these were the people that were faithful and suffered tribulation precisely because they believed in these things. Well, yeah, that, that's them. 
then didn't they already know all of this? Well, yeah, at least from a mortal perspective. But you want to talk about a divine refresher course? You want to learn about redemption from the Redeemer? You want to learn about the resurrection from the first fruits of them that slept? Wow. Uh, that's, that's a class I want to sign up for. And to be there as the Son of God comes and declares liberty to the captives. And doesn't just declare it, teaches how he made it all possible. Oh, there would be rapt attention for this particular lesson. Now it's verse 20 where we see the first div dividing line. Unto the wicked he did not go. Among the ungodly and the unrepentant who had defiled themselves while in the flesh, his voice was not raised. Now here we see this dividing line, the, the, the dotted one. The whole thing is prison in a way because all of us are, are bemoaning the absence of our bodies. Okay, The resurrection has not taken place yet. But there are those who know that it will. And when he comes to, to make that happen, to, to declare liberty to the captives, they are the ones rejoicing. Elsewhere in the prison side of prison, they, they don't understand these things. His voice isn't raised. In 21, neither did the rebellious who rejected the testimonies and the warnings of the ancient prophets behold his presence, nor look upon his face. They wouldn't do it in life, and they're not going to do it in death. Whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. They raised their voice, and you didn't heed. So I'm not going to come and declare these things to you. But you know, I will give you another chance for them to do so. For you to listen to those you wouldn't listen to in life, as well as those that never had the chance. So 22, where these were, darkness reigned, but among the righteous there was peace. Now you really see the, the stark distinction between paradise and prison. Now verse 23, the saints rejoiced in their redemption and bowed the knee and acknowledged the Son of God as their Redeemer and Deliverer from death and the chains of hell. So another nod to their physical imprisonment, even though it wasn't a mental, emotional, or spiritual one. 24, their countenance is shown, and the radiance from the presence of the Lord rested upon them, and they sang praises unto his holy name. Have you received his image in your countenance? Alma asked. Well, here their countenances are, are reflecting the radiance of Jesus. In verse 25, President Smith then says, I marveled. Remember, Uncle Joseph had been doing that in his vision of 137. He marveled at what he's seen. How is this all possible? Well, now a nephew, Joseph F., is marveling too. And here's why. I mean, he sees this in vision, but then his, his mind keeps reverting back to Scripture and trying to make sense of things where how does this fit with what I already know? That's an important part of Scripture study too. Now, and just living with living prophets. When they teach us truth, it might cause us to marvel as we try to integrate new light with existing understanding. And that's something we need to, to, to get better at also. Take what we have, be open to new truth that God is revealing. And if we marvel over how do these things fit, well, let that marveling motivate you to try to reconcile the two. That's what Joseph F. Smith is doing. I marveled for I understood that the Savior spent about three years in his ministry among the Jews and those of the house of Israel, endeavoring to teach them the everlasting gospel and call them unto repentance. I mean, talk about a very short ministry. Uh, in some ways, the fraction of time that the Savior spent on the earth preaching is, is a, a, a blink of the eye, a snap of the fingers, compared to all of the earth's existence. And that, in fact, that's probably about as small a fraction as the number of people that were saved on the ark. Uh, and, but again, it's just symbolic of a far greater work. And so here, the three years that Jesus spent in mortality is symbolic of a far greater and more far-reaching work that, that will continue to take place, especially when you see verse 26. Yet notwithstanding his mighty works and miracles and proclamation of the truth and great power and authority, there were but few who hearkened to his voice and rejoiced in his presence and received salvation at his hands. I mean, for anyone who's ever felt unsuccessful as a missionary, verse 26 should reassure you, you're not alone. If even Jesus, with his might and miracle, with his power and authority, was relatively unsuccessful in his mortal ministry, 
that should put in perspective just how much we'll be able to accomplish in this life only. Remember that great verse in 1 Corinthians 15 when Peter, excuse me, Paul, is talking about the resurrection and he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. It's like if this life is all we get, then I want my money back. Uh, that was a blink of the eye. But it's, this isn't all we get. And if this life is all we get to try to build the kingdom or try to extend the love of God, I haven't done much. But this life isn't it. What Jesus did in three years was just a preview of coming attractions. And his ministry, has the, the shadow of, his, of that three years has extended across time ever since. And I couple that with what happens in the spirit world, and we have no idea just how much good we will be able to accomplish in the big picture. However limited or fractional our, our mortal life contributions might be. Verse 27, but his ministry among those who were dead was limited to the brief time intervening between the crucifixion and his resurrection. You think three years was short for mortality? Well, imagine three days. In fact, it was just parts of three days from Friday to Sunday that Jesus was able to be there among the dead to preach to the spirits in prison. Again, to talk about a tiny sliver of time compared to the amount of work that must be done. So now verse 28, I wondered. So again, so much mental exertion is going on for Joseph F. Smith. He's studied scripture, he's pondered, he's engaged. Then the eyes of his understanding open and he has this vision. But then with the vision, he goes back to the scriptures. See how it's kind of tag team learning from the Lord directly and then going back to scripture and trying to make sense of what he's, he's understood before. So now with this new insight, 28, he wonders at the words of Peter wherein he said that the Son of God preached unto the spirits in prison, who sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So he's going back to 1 Peter 3. And how it was possible for him to preach to those spirits and perform the necessary labor among them in so short a time. How on earth are you going to extend the blessings of the gospel to everyone who's ever lived when, when you've got an appointment on Sunday morning at the garden tomb? Mary will be there weeping and without knowing it, waiting for you. There's a lot to do between, between Friday and Sunday. Well, how does it work? Verse 29, as I wondered. He's wondering in 28. He's wondering in 29. Don't stop your scripture study. We have such a, we, we brag about high pain thresholds. That's good. Don't brag about a high ignorance threshold. It's like, ah, I don't get it, but no big deal. No, wonder. Okay, wrestle with these things. I want them to make sense to me. And then the Lord sees that effort, that exertion, and boy, does he bless us. As I wondered, my eyes were opened. I thought they were opened a couple of verses ago when the vision started. Well, yeah, they keep opening wider and wider. My eyes were opened and my understanding quickened, which means to be made alive. Our dead perceptions and dead understandings are resurrected in a way. My understanding quickened. I perceived that the Lord went not in person, among the wicked and the disobedient who had rejected the truth to teach them. So that's the key. Oh, it didn't happen in person. He spent that time with the righteous instead, the paradise side of prison, as opposed to the prison side of prison. But when he was there, more than just teach, he organized, he commissioned, he called. That's what he says in verse 30. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers, clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. Verse 30 is the key passage in this revelation because that's what it all clicks for Joseph F. Smith. That's how he does it. Christ came and in that brief interval, but well, in fact, it's the same thing. The questions he keeps asking, it's like these echoes of answers. Only three years to a very tiny group of Israelites? Well, don't, don't worry. Uh, by choosing a chosen people and then commissioning them to choose the rest of the world, that then that three-year ministry will be multiplied exponentially as the people that well, what does it say in section 88? It behooveth those who have been warned to warn their neighbor. 
I'm taking a very short amount of time and trying to multiply its effectiveness by commissioning a bunch of people to pick up where I left off to continue the work that I've done. Way back, I think in section 26, if I remember, we were talking about time management. And I told the story of a general authority coming to Puerto Rico and asking the church leaders there, what would you do if you only had three hours to serve in your calling? And the unlucky soul that was picked out of the crowd to give his answers publicly. One of the things he said was, I'd have a meeting so that I could gather my, you know, I'm the district president. I would gather my counselors and the high council. And in that one hour, say if I had three hours, I would have family home meeting for one hour and go on splits with the missionaries for another hour. But for the other hour, I would run the church. Now, knowing I can't run the church in an hour, I can have a meeting, though, and make sure that everyone knows what they should be doing if they're not confined to three hours. Again, I thought, that's genius. And in some ways, that's the three-year ministry of Jesus and the three-day ministry of Christ in the spirit world. It's fascinating to think of, of his life as almost a, a practice version in mortality of what he's going to do in post-mortality. Take a, a very brief period of time that by outside perspective seemed rather unsuccessful and turn it into the greatest success in history as he commissions and clothes, as he empowers and authorizes people to extend to others what he had given to them. And the beauty of that is it blesses the giver as well as the receiver. I get to be involved in this. I get to learn from Jesus, but then teach it to others. And we all know you learn more when you're the one teaching. Believe me, I've been learning a lot about that this year. I love what Joseph Smith is learning here. And best of all, I love what we get to participate in as a result. Now, verse 31, chosen messengers went forth to declare the acceptable day of the Lord and proclaim liberty to the captives who were bound, even unto all who would repent of their sins and receive the gospel. No wonder back in verse 19, the Lord preaches to the, to the spirits in paradise the everlasting gospel. They need that refresher course. It's like no matter how well you learned it and knew it in life, I need you to be the best teachers in eternity. So here's your refresher course. Here's your, 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 your post-mission MTC so that you can then relearn uh, and, and just gain again a testimony of the things you spent your life living so that you can then teach it to those who never had the chance. You see, it was Isaiah who originally used those phrases to, to declare the acceptable day of the Lord, to proclaim liberty to the captives who are bound. Uh, that's Isaiah 61. That's actually the passage that Jesus quotes when he's at his own home synagogue in Nazareth. He reads that verse that everybody knows is messianic prophecy. And then he says, yep, that's talking about me. This day are these words fulfilled in your ears. I've come to declare liberty to the captives. But the beauty of that is the Lord never wants to be alone in his mission. He's constantly empowering and preparing other people to do the same. Uh, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember that generous plural pronoun. You and me, John, in the baptism. You and me, Elder Halverson, in Puerto Rico. You and me in your calling, in your, in your raising of children, in whatever work you're engaged in. You get to declare liberty to. You get to declare the acceptable day of the Lord. And throughout it all, what is Jesus doing? He's multiplying himself by multiplying messengers. When Elder David A. Bednar was first called to be state president in Arkansas, the general authority that extended the call to him said, well, President Bednar, your first order of business is to prepare a multitude of men who can replace you. And Elder Bednar was kind of laughing, going, I've been a state president for like two minutes and you're already planning on my successor? Well, yeah. Uh, and to prepare a multitude, that's how we multiply the kingdom of God. It's exactly what the Lord is doing here. Verse 32, that's how it works. Thus was the gospel preached to those who had died in their sins without a knowledge of the truth or in transgression, having rejected the prophets. I love that it includes both groups, both the ignorant as well as the rebellious. People that didn't know as well as people who would not know. The Lord is trying to give chances for all of them, whether that's celestial, like we see in 137, I never knew, but I would have accepted if I'd had the chance 
or terrestrial, like we saw in section 76, that they wouldn't receive it in this life, but perhaps might receive it here. You see how generous God is in bumping back final judgment until that judgment really can be final? That you really don't want to progress any further than this? You won't receive what I want to give you, so you'll only receive what you're willing to accept? Okay. Until then, though, whether the ignorant or the rebellious, I keep teaching, keep giving them chances. Verse 33, these were taught, notice the lesson. One, faith in God. Two, repentance from sin. Three, vicarious baptism for the remission of sins. And four, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. And that will be vicarious also. I love verse 33 because that's the post-mortal version of the fourth article of faith. In this life, it's first faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and second repentance, and third baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and fourth the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, same thing here. Just add vicarious. Okay? Some, the principles can be lived here. The ordinances needed to be performed there. But don't worry. We got that taken care of. Uh, we've got missionaries. In, in some ways, I've always thought about that with sister missionaries uh, that have priesthood authority to preach but not priesthood ordination to administer ordinances. Uh, and so there's a division of priesthood when it comes to sister missionaries and, and elder missionaries, for example. And so it's interesting to see sister missionaries with being clothed and commissioned and empowered and authorized to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to preach faith in God and repentance of sin. But when it came time for baptism and confirmation, they had to trust that someone else would be there to do that. That there would be elders with the, with the authority to perform those ordinances. Well, in some ways, in the spirit world, we all have that kind of experience. Of I'm doing my very best under my portion of authority to preach the gospel. But I have to trust in other people with a different portion of authority to finish the job. It's like what Paul said, I've planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. It's, we're all in this thing together. I love the fact that really, if you think about it, none of us can do the whole job ourselves, which forces Zion upon us as we work together, as we consecrate our efforts and hope others will do the same. Same thing even happens with that. And so here we are performing the work for the dead to, to couple our efforts with those spirit world missionaries that are doing the teaching. Talk about a thin veil between us, right? Verse 34, and all other principles of the gospel. So we didn't just stop with the fourth article of faith. Beyond it, we teach all other principles of the gospel that are necessary for them to know in order to qualify themselves that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. There's a repetition of what he learned from 1 Peter chapter 4. So we need to teach them everything they need to know. Uh, I, we've talked about doing all those vicarious ordinances, but there's also this need for learning principles of the gospel. I need to become. Remember the difference between a temple wedding and a temple marriage? Between a celestial ordinance and a celestial life that follows? Well, what else do you need to know to accept those ordinances and to live that life? Can we help you become what you need to become by learning what you need to learn? In verse 35, so it was made known among the dead, both small and great, the unrighteous as well as the faithful. So the unrighteous are the ones in the prison side of prison, and the faithful are the ones on the paradise side of prison. <laughs> okay? That redemption had been wrought through the sacrifice of the Son of God upon the cross. Talk about a news flash. It just happened. He just suffered those things. Everything that, that all of Old Testament history was pointing towards, those saints lived in eager anticipation. Well, now we are living in the day of fulfillment. It's happened. And so for liberty to be declared to both the faithful and the unrighteous, both the paradise side and the prison side of the spirit world. Prison the whole thing until this moment. But some knew about it and some others didn't. I remember having conversations with Elder Mortensen on my mission. We were never companions, but man, we loved each other as far as uh, exchanges were concerned. And, and I just, we had the most amazing conversations as we were walking around the streets of Puerto Rico trying to find somebody that would listen to us. We talked often about 
what constituted a real opportunity to accept the gospel? Because sometimes it's a matter of, well, I knocked on their door and they slammed it, so there was their chance. Well, did they even know who we were? Or, well, I taught them a discussion and they, they wouldn't re accept the Book of Mormon. Or I, I taught them a few discussions and, and they eventually rejected it. Well, there's, there's their chance. Oh, careful. I love the fact that Section 138 <laughs> makes it crystal clear. Everyone gets taught it all over again, no matter how much or how little you learned or knew. I imagine those that even spent their lives teaching these truths will sit there going, that totally makes sense now. Huh. Really sorry for the way I, <laughs> I mistaught that uh, during mortality. Believe me, I feel that. Well, sometimes I look back at old lesson plans I taught or, or when I first began teaching seminary, and I look at that and I'm like, wow. I mean, technically it's not false doctrine, but man, I didn't know anything. I, and I'm sure that I'm going to feel the same thing. Believe me, in the spirit world, nobody's going to want to watch these videos. Nobody. Unless just by, by way of, wow, okay, baby steps, Brother Halverson, uh, good try. Uh, it's not just the technology that it's improved. It's our understanding that has. But what Elder Mortens and I always wrestled with was, are we giving people a real opportunity? Or even people that we taught all the discussions to, whether they accepted or rejected, when they learn the gospel again by celestial missionaries, or if they were already celestial, by the Lord himself, how close will that be to whatever my lame attempts were at teaching the gospel? The way Elder Mortensen and I were discussing it, it was just that became our goal, to teach the investigators in Puerto Rico as closely as possible to whatever kind of lesson they'd be learning in the spirit world. If we could approximate that to the point that people could feel that, yes, I had a legitimate opportunity, and that when they learn it there, yes, it will be far improved, but will it at least be close enough that they'll recognize, oh yeah, that is what Elder Halverson and Elder Mortensen were trying to teach me on that trade-off that they were on. This is ringing heavenly bells. Well, 36 and 37 then re-summarize what we've just learned. Thus was it made known that our Redeemer spent his time during his sojourn in the world of spirits, instructing and preparing the faithful spirits of the prophets who had testified of him in the flesh, just like he did during those three years of mortal ministry, instructing, preparing, faithful followers. 37, that they might carry the message of redemption unto all the dead, unto whom he could not go personally because of their rebellion and transgression, that they through the ministration of his servants might also hear his words. Again, whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it's the same. So listen to them. They've been clothed and commissioned and authorized and empowered. They can be trusted here. It reminds me of Alma's great prayer in Alma 29. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of my heart. I'd, I'd be the type that would cry repentance with the voice of a trump and shake the earth so that all people would hear me. And then later, as he comes to terms with the limits of his own mission, he realizes, okay, I guess I'm not the only one that's going to cry repentance. And what a blessing that God lets other people do the same work because it changes them too. Yes, the Lord could have taught these lessons to everyone. The fact he didn't, not just speaks of his justice towards the unrighteous, but his mercy toward the faithful. You get to keep teaching these things. It'll change you in the process. Now, who was among this spirit world MTC? Notice the list beginning in verse 38. Among the great and mighty ones who were assembled in this vast congregation of the righteous. And again, he talked about vast multitude back in 18. This is an innumerable host. So this vast congregation of the righteous, first of all, Father Adam, the Ancient of Days, Father of all, figures it would, our list would start with him since it's his posterity that he wants to make sure the, the, the word gets to. If Heavenly Father looked upon all of his children with paternal regard, then of course Adam is going to as well. How do I make sure that no one is left out, no empty chairs at these tables? And of course, if Father Adam is preaching, then 39, he has an eternal companion. Our glorious Mother Eve, with many of her faithful daughters, who had lived through the ages and worshipped the true and living God. I am so grateful for verse 39. As a, as a father of three incredible daughters, 
as a, as a husband of one glorious wife, uh, as the son of a mother and grandmothers that, that taught the gospel and served missions. And it's amazing to see this, this group of sister missionaries. Sadly, we're missing so many of their names from scripture, but they are named and known by God. And here they are included, right? That was just this host of sister missionaries being trained by, I, to me, there's still, that's the, the, the biggest thing that we need to change in the missionary department is the name of the mission president's wife. We don't have a good title for that. And I, and I loved my mission president's wives. They were the mission mom and, and raised and nurtured us. And I'm so grateful for them. Uh, mission matron, maybe that's a better name. We use that in the temple. Uh, and more and more, it's becoming husband and wife as equal partners, even leading in mission field. Uh, I look forward to continued growth and progress in that department. But here, to see this ultimate set of senior missionaries, Adam and Eve, leading their posterity forward as, as mission presidents in the spirit world, and to have this host of sister missionaries that Mother Eve is personally preparing, uh, I love that thought. Who else is there? Verse 40, Abel, the first martyr, was there. His brother Seth, one of the mighty ones, who was in the express image of his father, Adam. So whether it's an Abel, whose work in mortality is cut short, or a Seth, whose work in mortality is allowed to continue, either way, in some ways, it's, it's cut short for all of us. None of us can do enough in this life. That's why John the, the Beloved back in section 7 was like, can I stick around? Can I have a few extra centuries, millennia, whatever it takes? I just want to keep doing what I've been doing. Other than those kinds of options, or the three Nephites, for example, it's all cut short, whether you're an Abel or a Seth. But can the work continue? In verse 41, Noah, who gave warning of the flood, again, poster children for the mercy of God, you saved so few in this life, but you will save far more in the next. That was just preliminary work. In some ways, what, what, what do they say? That the MTC is to the mission as your mission is to life? Well, in some ways, keep, do another, a third round as your life is to post-mortal existence and the work you'll continue to do in the spirit world where time isn't an issue. So Noah, be, be grateful for an extended mission that will be far more successful than the one you had in life. Shem, the great high priest, you too. Abraham, the father of the faithful. Well, you'll have far more posterity on the other side than you ever had on this one. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the great lawgiver of Israel. I love this. I mean, talk about an MTC district. I love the ones that I got to teach when I, when I taught there. But wow, these, these are the, this is the ultimate. Verse 42, other people that you might not expect to include. But as you read the list, it's amazing that they're all couched in the context of work for the dead. I mean, if they talked about it or prophesied of it or worked towards it in this life, it seems only fitting that they'd be able to continue the work in the next. So 42, how about Isaiah? Can you picture him? He must be the one teaching the really, really intellectual elite in the spirit world because they can understand him, okay? Maybe he gets to pair up with Elder Maxwell or something. Uh, maybe he's paired up with, well, maybe it's Nephi again, Mr. Glory and Plainness, who always quoted Mr. I Glory and something else. Uh, but what a great tag team where if you get confused, Nephi can explain it. But if you're not quite as inspired by Nephi, then, then Isaiah can breathe in some poetry and power. So 42, Isaiah, who declared by prophecy that the Redeemer was anointed to bind up the brokenhearted. And then the phrase that should be familiar to us by now, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that were bound. Of course, he's going to be there too. Verse 43, moreover, Ezekiel. Now, he's one that we don't think about very often, but why would he pop into Joseph F. Smith's mind? Well, because his mind reverted to scripture all the time. And if he's good enough to think about Cappadocia, then he's definitely good enough to recall the Valley of the Dry Bones. And so he does. Ezekiel, who was shown in vision the great valley of dry bones, which were to be clothed upon with flesh, to come forth again in the resurrection of the dead, living souls. Ezekiel, you prophesied of the resurrection. You want to do it far more close to the action? You want to, to go into that valley of dry bones, so to speak, and, and let people know that 
that theirs would be returning with, with flesh and sinew. Powerful. In verse 44, Daniel, there's another one, who foresaw and foretold the establishment of the kingdom of God in the latter days, never again to be destroyed nor given to other people. Again, you see how jo Joseph S. Smith is couching all of these. It's like, what are your credentials? Remember back in section 27, all of these ancient worthies that will come to that great last sacrament meeting? And what brings them there? They have keys to contribute. And that then is the keys that run throughout section 27. Well, here, it's a connection to work for the dead, or the resurrection, or the restoration, which will make all of these things possible. Daniel explained that dream of the stone cut out of the mountain without hands rolling forth to fill the earth, and it's happening. Of course he's up there stoked as what he sees. And for him to be able to, be, to participate in that declaring of, of liberty to the captives, of course. Then 45, Elias, who was with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, based on what we know about the Mount of Transfiguration, that Elias, which is a title as much as it is a name, is John the Baptist. And so to think of he who prepared the way for Christ, but whose life was cut short in mortality, by now to be able to be resurrected, if Christ is the first fruits, oh, I imagine it didn't take long to extend that blessing to his cousin, to his, his forerunner, his lead blocker, uh, John the Baptist. He gets to continue his work in preparing the world for Jesus Christ. 46, how about Malachi? the prophet, who testified of the coming of Elijah, of whom also Moroni spake to the prophet Joseph Smith, declaring that he should come before the ushering in of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. They were also there as well. I mean, talk about a district. Everyone, I mean, the way Malachi performed his mission and testified of this coming day where all the loose ends would be wrapped up, that's what spirit world ministry is all about, to wrap up every loose end to bind on earth, our side of the veil, what would then be bound in heaven, their side of the veil. No wonder Malachi is allowed to participate in this. Verse 47, speaking of Elijah, the prophet Elijah was to plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers. And it's through the redemption of the dead that God can keep all those promises. It's through what we do in the temple that hearts are turning in either direction, connecting across the veil. 48, all of that was to foreshadow the great work to be done in the temples of the Lord in the dispensation of the fullness of times for the redemption of the dead and the sealing of the children to their parents, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse and utterly wasted at his coming. We've talked about that multiple times, that, that this earth was meant to be a forest of family trees, not a desolate logging camp with people cut off from their branches and their roots. This is what is making all of this possible. It's where God can keep his promises. In verse 49, don't just think biblical time. Think Book of Mormon as well. All these and many more, even the prophets who dwelt among the Nephites and testified of the coming of the Son of God, mingled in the vast assembly and waited for their deliverance. Can you picture that scene? Oh, it reminds me of general conference in some ways where there are people from all nations just gathering together or mingling with one another and seeing different cultures and languages. And it's incredible. Uh, here we ask things like, oh, where are you from? Can you imagine there? It's like, when did you live? How were you involved in the work of God in your life? What dispensation were you a part of? Incredible. Old world, new world, uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Abraham, Adam, Eve, faithful daughters, faithful sons. And notice the phrase in 49 again, these and many more. Remember, this is a vast multitude, a vast congregation, innumerable hosts of the dead. Who else might it have included? Now, verse 50, for the dead had looked upon the long absence of their spirits from their bodies as a bondage. That's why I refer to the entire spirit world as spirit prison just with a mental paradise for those who knew they would be freed. 51, these the Lord taught and gave them power to come forth after his resurrection from the dead. Again, he's the first fruits of them that slept to enter into his father's kingdom, there to be crowned with immortality and eternal life. No wonder there's crowns to be given because there's a throne to be shared. Come and sit with me. 
rejoice with me. Come home to me. These are heavenly parents that just want to scoop us up, sit us on their lap, so to speak. If you think of that, just a child with a grandparent, for example, and just wanting to hold them. This is a family reunion, not just a mission reunion. And it's a family reunion that is meant to perpetuate what we could call the family business, which is extending the gospel of Jesus Christ to all God's children. That's why he chose us to choose everyone else. So verse 52, they continue thenceforth their labor as had been promised by the Lord and be partakers of all blessings which were held in reserve for them that love him. I love that last phrase. If eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard and heart never has entered into the heart of man that which God hath prepared for those that love him. Well, this is where they finally get to see with their eyes and hear with their ears and f imagine with their hearts, I do love you. And this is what you've prepared and held in reserve for me because you love me too. To continue that labor, <laughs> of course, we, don't, we wouldn't want death to end it. If you felt that at the end of your mission, I just want to extend. If you felt inklings of th three Nephites and John the Beloved, well, we all get that dream. We all get that wish in the next life. Then in verse 53, we shift our attention. From 53 to about 57, Joseph F. Smith looks in a different direction. He's been watching those who lived and died before Jesus Christ. That are the ones that are waiting to be freed. Well, what about those who live and die after Jesus Christ? Remember Uncle Joseph had a similar experience in 137? Okay, uh, Alvin's gonna make it because those who lived before the restoration have, still have a chance. Oh, well, the, those who lived after the restoration and didn't get the opportunity, they'll have a chance too. Well, what about these? Those faithful who lived before Christ, well, these are the BC saints that get to continue their mission. What about AD saints? Do they get to continue their mission too? Well, the answer is a resounding yes, but notice how it's described starting in verse 53. The prophet Joseph Smith, fitting to begin with him, if we start this part with Joseph Smith, just like we've started the other part with Father Adam. Here's the father of our dispensation. The prophet Joseph Smith and my father, Hiram Smith, very fitting there as well, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, and other choice spirits who were reserved to come forth in the fullness of times to take part in laying the foundations of the great Latter-day work. So here's President Smith, including his prophetic predecessors, including other choice spirits. Again, let your mind fill in some of those blanks and allow the spirit to confirm your participation in this group. If we saw the many more in 49, we get to see the other choice spirits in 53. People that God had reserved for this day. We have been saved for these latter days. We sing that song. Do we feel it? Do we sense our partnership with those who have gone before. So if we're here to lay the foundations of the great Latter-day work, 54 continues, including the building of the temples and the performance of ordinances therein for the redemption of the dead, we're also in the spirit world. Again, what are our credentials? If their credentials were, were prophetic and foreshadowing, are our credentials participation and continuation? We did this. We did this work. We helped build temples. We helped participate in the, in the redemption of the dead. We spent our mortal lives extending the blessings of salvation. Of course, we're going to st spend our, our eternal lives doing the same. 55, I observed that they were also among the noble and great ones who were chosen in the beginning to be rulers in the church of God. I mean, there's a nod to Abraham chapter 3, that as God presents his plan, he, he gathers the noble and great ones and says, these I will make my rulers. They, they were faithful here. They'll be faithful there. They've been wanting to build the kingdom here. They're definitely going to want to continue it there. And in fact, they're going to want to continue it even after they come back. That's what he gets at in 57. But before that, 56, even before they were born. So now we're talking about their premortality and perhaps our premortality. After all, it's not just they, it's they with many others. The inclusiveness of this is so beautiful. So include yourself in 56. They, with many others, received their first lessons in the world of spirits 
and were prepared to come forth in the due time of the Lord to labor in his vineyard for the salvation of the souls of men. Now you and I share in the same due time of the Lord because we're living at the same time. Whoever, whether it's Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or John Taylor or Joseph S. Smith or whomever God has gone before us, they were reserved, save for these latter days. They were prepared to come forth. And what prepared them? Lessons. First, lessons. We saw when Jesus first comes to the spirit world, he gives them lessons again, refresher course. And it sounds like it's a refresher, not just from what they learned and lived and taught in mortality, but what they learned and promised to live in pre-mortality. We talk about the Spirit, this is John 14, when Jesus says to the apostles of the Last Supper that one of the roles of the Holy Ghost is to bring all things to our remembrance. Well, I'm sure you've had experience of learning something new that for some strange reason didn't feel new at all. It was like new cognitively or mentally, but it was old spiritually. It just rang true. There's almost this oh, educational deja vu of, I think I knew this once. Uh, I must have forgotten somehow. And as the veil robs us of those memories, but as the Spirit peeks through the veil and reminds us of truths once learned and loved, well, now we get to learn them and love them and live them again. But we had our first lessons. I loved watching that in the mission field of just lights come on. No wonder, man, sacado del aire, you took me out of the air because I wasn't always in it. I just started kind of floating around in confusion once I forgot my premortal lessons. Thank you for the reminder. By the way, if we and those other noble and great who were prepared to come forth in this day, if they received their first lessons, then imagine, I would, I would assume that the greater the, the role, the, the higher the mission, the more important the preparation would be. And therefore, the greater those first lessons would have been. Uh, did I take AP first lesson or, or honors course or was I just kind of entry level? Okay? Because there's a phrase that we find throughout scripture about Jesus Christ being foreordained, about being prepared, there is a verse in Peter, for example. We spent a lot of time with Peter today. At one point, he calls Jesus the lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So there we know that even in premortality, Jesus was foreordained. Here am I, send me. He was the one to volunteer because he was the one best prepared. But when the scriptures talk about the atonement being prepared from before the foundation of the world, it's more like the object, like, well, the atonement is part of the plan. Of course, there was going to be an atonement. It was prepared. But if you remember this tiny detail from the baptismal prayer of Alma to Helam at the Waters of Mormon, it's a much longer prayer than what we say today. But he said this, I baptize thee having authority from the Almighty God. He goes on for a while and then says, and may he, still referring to God, grant unto you eternal life through the redemption of Christ, and then hold on to this pronoun, whom he has prepared from the foundation of the world. Did you catch that? The bombshell truth that Alma drops in that, in that baptismal prayer is whom he, whom is Jesus, he is the Father, the, whom he has prepared from before the foundation of the world, whom God prepared. I mean, who better to prepare the Son than the Father? I don't know who else taught these first lessons, but in a classroom of one, it seems that the Savior of the world was prepared personally by the Father of us all. Who better to do so? I also wonder, based on what we're seeing here at the end of section 138, this is all visions of the spirit world, but there's this shift that we just saw of Joseph F. Smith seeing all those who had lived and died, and so they're now in the spirit world, continuing their labors. But then he shifts and he talks about Joseph and Hiram and Brigham and John and Wilford and, and many others and, and choice people that were noble and great, chosen to come and be rulers in the kingdom of God. There seems to be this kind of bleeding together of of those that died before Jesus and those that lived and died after. 
And then he's talking about being foreordained beforehand. Now, based on that phrase in 56, they received their first lessons in the world of spirits. Now, I don't know what to do with this. So if any of you know more clearly than I do, please share in the comments. But there when it says that the, now these are pre-mortal spirits receiving first lessons, but the lessons are received in the world of spirits. Now, this whole revelation, we've been seeing the world of spirits, but it's post-mortal spirits. They're the ones that have lived their lives and are waiting for the coming of Christ to declare liberty from, to the captives. Are these two separate spirit worlds? Or, or are they one and the same? I don't know enough about the geography of heaven <laughs> or, or pre-mortality or post-mortality uh, to know for sure. If they're separate, if there's some overlap, if there's a dotted line or a solid one, like we've seen with paradise and prison, I don't know. But, I, but the possibility of this being the same or some overlap or some, I don't know, foreign exchange students or whatever it might be of post-mortal mingling with pre-mortal. I, 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 I honestly, I don't know how clear a distinction we need to make between everything we've studied so far and what we see in 53 through 56. Because it's interesting in our life, who teaches pre-missionaries at the MTC? Return missionaries do. It's like, I've, I lived this life and I want to prepare you to succeed at living it too. I don't know, but can you imagine being prepared in those first lessons by people that had to learn them and live them themselves through a mortal life? Can you imagine going and getting pre-mortal instruction about Isaiah from Isaiah? <laughs> can you imagine learning how to open your mouth from a, from a Nephi? Uh, just someone who's, who's been there, done that. And to be foreordained to come in this last dispensation, possibly prepared by those who participated in, in previous dispensations, I don't know. I don't know. But there's, there's something wonderful just to consider. Who was my MTC teacher in premortality? No clue. But have I taken advantage of those first lessons? to try to live them diligently here on earth. Now, whether or not their works continue along those lines, they do continue preaching the gospel. Uh, again, combine the two, and wouldn't that be an interesting, when I see missionaries take uh, teenagers with them on missionary splits, say, I'm teaching people the gospel. I want you to learn how to do it since you're going to be teaching it when you're in the missionary too. Is that happening? I don't know. But then 57 does expand upon what we've already learned. That those BC saints did continue their ministry after they lived and died. Same thing for the AD saints. 57, I beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation, and we would say the faithful sisters too, based on what we learned from Mother Eve, when they depart from mortal life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel of repentance and redemption through the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. They do it among those who are in darkness and under the bondage of sin in the great world of the spirits of the dead. That is glorious news. That the chance to extend your mission call didn't end with the coming of Christ. That even those of us that live in this final dispensation, when we die, if we were faithful here, of course we'll want to be faithful there. If we spent this life building momentum and establishing trajectory, then of course the next life is going to allow us to continue onward. This actually reminds me of an experience I had in college where me and my two roommates, the three of us, each got dates and we went on this triple date together. But we were driving up Provo Canyon and the road was slick and uh, from, from some rain and the car began to fishtail and ended up spinning around and then going off the side of the road and flipping upside down and, and stopping right up against the, the side of this mountain. Uh, and smashed windows, and we we're all hanging upside down from our seatbelts, and it was, it was a day we could have died. I honestly thought that was going to be the case. I remember as we started to fishtail, and it all started going slow-mo, like they, like they say, and I thought, I'm about to die. Huh. Hadn't planned that. At least I'm on a date. I guess that's a good way to go. It was weird because I wasn't scared of death. I honestly remember thinking, I hope my mom knows I'm okay. I mean, I'm dead, yeah, but that, that it was all right. I wasn't in pain, and I wasn't scared. Today was a good day to die. Uh, I haven't always had days like that, but that day would have been fine. 
And I just remember afterwards hanging from the seatbelts and un unbuckling and, you know, getting out, crawling out the back broken window. And there we were, all six of us, uh, cuts and bruises, but nothing major. And just surprised that we were all still alive. I don't know if it was my shock speaking or my testimony, but I turned to my roommates and I was like, dude, we were this close from being mission companions. And they're like, huh? I'm like, you know the doctrine, you know, we continue faithful. We, could, we would have been mission companions. We would have been preaching the gospel like the good old days. And they were both kind of like, uh, I'm like, too soon? Like, yeah, too soon. We're still in shock. Uh, but that's the doctrine. And, and I glory in it that the, the labors we perform in this life are merely previews of coming attractions. I know in my, I see in my parents, uh, they served a, a temple mission and they came back and they wanted to keep serving another one and now they're serving a family history mission and, and my dad's health particularly is just like, it's slowing me down and I just want to keep serving missions after mission. Uh, you will. If we're faithful here, we all will. And those missions, whether on this side of the veil or the other, the location doesn't matter. It's just a transfer. It's what Elder Maxwell said near the end of his life. Whether on this side or the other side, I just want to play in the game. God, just give me a jersey. Don't sit me on the bench uh, because of ill health. Just eat one way or the other. Now, perhaps that ill health is still some of those first lessons that we need to learn to prepare us to continue serving. Maybe we need to to realize the, the blessing of a body, even in, in, its, in its pain or in its difficulty or its age or its, its unhealth, knowing that we will see once it's gone the bondage of not having one and then rejoice in the glorious blessing of the resurrection. But again, those are blessings that we are anticipating, that we've been promised, that we are promising others and that we'll continue to promise them in the next life as we continue to serve and share the gospel. Verse 58 gives us the promise. The dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God. We saw before in this section that it's atonement and then ordinances. Well, we are performing those ordinances in the temple and redemption is promised. To the dead who repent, anyone who thinks that judgment comes before then, minimizes the possibility of post-mortal repentance. Now again, do not procrastinate the day of your repentance because if that's what we spend this life doing, chances are it's what we'll spend the next life doing. But please hold out hope. As I've often said to my students, permanent bad news is against my religion. I just trust in the, the ample provision of a God with paternal regard. Verse 59 balances this mercy with justice after they have paid the penalty of their transgressions and are washed clean, shall receive a reward according to their works, for they are heirs of salvation. We do have a telestial and a terrestrial and a celestial kingdom. In my Father's house there are many mansions. Those that rebelled before may have to pay the penalty of their transgressions. Remember section 19, if you don't repent, then you must suffer even as I suffered. There may be some, some personal payment there. But through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can be washed clean. We can be made worthy of some reward. We can be heirs of salvation through the author and finisher of our faith. Verse 60, Joseph F. Smith then concludes, Thus was the vision of the redemption of the dead revealed to me. And I bear record. And I know that this record is true. Through the blessing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Even so, amen. If you can echo President Smith's words and bear record that you know these things are true, then that's a blessing through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as well. I am grateful for that blessing. I am grateful that I've been able to participate in, in saving ordinances in the temple. I'm grateful to, be, to have been raised by people that want to continue that work themselves into their old age and beyond it. I do look forward to continued missions on both sides of the veil. I'm honored that God would allow us to participate in his saving work. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. And I'm grateful for a father in heaven with so much ample provision and so much paternal regard that he allows us to participate in one another's salvation. 
That is generous of him. The things that we learned today from, from Joseph Smith in 137 and from Joseph F. Smith in 138. Actually, there's, there's more parallels between the two. It's more than just uncle and nephew. The things that we see in 138 in some ways are expansions and explanations of the kinds of things that Joseph himself learned decades before. In fact, it's the same long statement where we get the paternal regard and the ample provision statements. And in it, you can hear a lot of foreshadowing towards the things that his nephew will reveal in 138. Joseph said, The situation of the Christian nations after death is a subject that has called forth all the wisdom and talent of the philosopher and the divine. And it is an opinion which is generally received that the destiny of man is irretrievably fixed at his death, and that he is made either eternally happy or eternally miserable. That if a man dies without a knowledge of God, he must be eternally damned without any mitigation of his punishment, alleviation of his pain, or the most latent hope of a deliverance while endless ages shall roll along. I mean, talk about bad news, right? But without further light and knowledge, that's all we're left with. Joseph goes on, however orthodox this principle may be, we shall find that it is at variance with the testimony of Holy Writ. In other words, it doesn't agree with Scripture. For our Savior says that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men wherewith they shall blaspheme, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. And then notice Joseph's focus on this phrase, neither in this world nor in the world to come. So he's just quoted from Matthew. So what does the prophet conclude? Evidently showing that there are sins which may be forgiven in the world to come, although the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven. I love Joseph's perspective on Scripture. It's like, okay, I know this is what people say, that once you die, that's it, and it's heaven or hell, and there's no change in that. Final judgment happens at the point of death. That's what they said about my brother Alvin. But that doesn't agree with Scripture. I mean, when his mind reverts, he thinks of this verse in Matthew as well as in Mark. And wait a minute, they can't be forgiven in this life or the world to come? That means some must be, hmm, okay. Well, how does that work? And he's going to learn line upon line. He goes on in this statement. Peter, hmm, he's one we've been quoting a lot today, also in speaking concerning our Savior says that he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So, like, like uncle, like nephew. This is a verse that, that their minds are referring or reverting to often. Here, then, we have an account of our Savior preaching to the spirits in prison, to spirits that had been imprisoned from the days of Noah. And what did he preach to them? That they were to stay there? Certainly not. I love how Joseph is just shocked by what he's going to say. Hey, nice to meet you all. Stay put. Certainly not. Let his own declaration testify. And then he quotes from Luke. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. There's Jesus quoting Isaiah. Just like in this revelation, uh, it keeps coming up, liberty to the captives. Joseph then concludes, Isaiah has it to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness from the prison house. That's a, a different Isaiah passage. It is very evident from this that he not only went to preach to them, but to deliver or bring them out of the prison house. I love Joseph's example of scripture study. I mean, that's where his nephew got it. He's just piecing together all these passages and realizing, no, the world's got it wrong. Uh, there has to be post-mortal possibilities that include repentance and redemption. If Jesus is going to preach to the spirits in prison, it's not going to be to rub salt into their wounds and say, you're stuck here, sorry. No, it's to deliver the captives. That's exactly what must be happening. We can do that with work for the dead. Okay, it's all coming together. Now, he still doesn't understand the logistics that his nephew will get. And so that is still part of this line upon line increase of understanding. And I, for one, am grateful to be living in an age where the restoration is ongoing and revelation continues to flow to save both the living as well as the dead. Two other quick passages of scripture. There's one in the 88th Psalm where the psalmist asks rhetorically, wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? 
Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? The answer to all four of those questions is a resounding yes. The Lord has come to promise all of that. The dead will arise and praise him. I hope the living are doing so already. One other psalm from the 68th. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. Such a beautiful promise. As we've studied these sections today, God does bring out those that are bound with chains. He does break the chains of death, the bonds of hell. And not only that, but the other part of that passage, he sets the solitary in families. That is beautiful. To anyone who has felt cut off from loved ones, he's breaking certain bonds, but reforging other ones, the ones we want to hold on to. And if you have felt cut off from family, no wonder it's Adam and Eve that are a part of this process. I want all my children home. But even more than that, no wonder it's heavenly parents that have established this plan of redemption, of happiness, of an eternal family. My friends, I testify. I'm grateful for the blessing of Christ so that I can bear record that this is true. I testify of loving parents with paternal and maternal regard and testify of the ample provision that they have made for every one of us to return to their presence. If you have ever felt solitary, God will restore you to family, namely to his family. We're all coming home.